five o'clock, but I am going to wait one extra minute uh, for those that may be logging on. And just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Just want to disclose to everybody that is on the meeting that this meeting will be recorded. Okay, it is now 5.01 p.m. Uh, we wanna welcome everybody to this special board meeting, November 5th, 2020, and I'm gonna call the meeting to order. And I'm gonna ask that everybody uh, who is in attendance, please rise. I did find a flag so that we could say our pledge. So please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Okay, thank you, everybody. I knew, I knew that flag would come in handy one day. That's why we saved it. Okay, once again, I want to welcome you to this specially, uh, special uh, board meeting of November 5th, 2020. There are a couple of items that we are uh, taking action on this evening. Um, one, we have a public hearing about the William Floyd School District draft safety plan. As per Commissioner Regulation Part 155.17, school districts are required to develop a district-wide school safety plan in alignment with building level emergency response plans. Pursuant to the same Commissioner Regulation, a public hearing must be held to present the new plan. The public hearing for the district-wide safety plan will be held for 30 days starting today through December 5th, 2020, adopted by the board uh, we will take action on it on December 8th, 2020. Questions and or comments should be sent to the district clerk, Carolyn Visitin, via email at cvisitin, V-I-S-I-N-T-I-N, at wfsd.k12.ny.us. The plan will also be made available on the district website. So to tell us more about the draft safety plan, I'm going to uh, first kick it over to Mr. Coster. Uh, to discuss uh, the parameters of it, and I believe he'll uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Mike Stan, Mr. Coster. Thank you, thank you, President Vecchio. Uh, as you stated, this is a requirement from the commissioner, um, and has to be activated in a public hearing forum, which is kept open for a certain time period before it can be board approved. Um, you know, obviously, school safety, especially during a pandemic that we're experiencing, is paramount. Uh, Mike Stam, our Director of Human Resources, also our Director of Security, um, also um, a, uh, a, a lawyer, um, has worked tirelessly on this plan uh, with the team, and we are very confident that it will be one of the very best uh, that, that, that is uh, in our region, and uh, we anxiously await uh, feedback. Uh, Mike, uh, why don't you just share uh, the cliff notes and, the de and some of the information with the Board of Education, please. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Costa. Thank you, Board of Education. Uh, our plan is really a compilation of the hard work that the district has done, um, I would say over the past 10 years. Uh, whenever we have our plan reviewed uh, by law enforcement, we have um, very, very high grades. And the reason why is because there's been a commitment to the resources necessary uh, to make this effective. Uh, part of our plan includes our perimeter fencing, our guard booths, vestibules, smart school upgrades, facility inspections that we do regularly, and um, our staffing. Um, we regularly uh, receive very, very positive feedback. Uh, each year it's reviewed by the Suffolk County Department of, uh, I'm sorry, Suffolk County Police Department, as well as uh, Homeland Security. Um, and as a matter of fact, they use our plan as a model with other districts. Um, we feel good about our plan. Uh, our schools have been administering all of our safety drills this year 
uh, faithfully, even uh, despite um, uh, different circumstances, to say the least. Um, and uh, we are fully in compliant with everything on the plan. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Stam, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'm going to turn it to the board members here uh, this evening to see if they have any questions. Vice President Coppola, any questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Guerriero, any questions? No, thank you. I'm good at this time. Ms. Mentz. All good. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Casarino. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stam, uh, in regards to some of the technology that is already in place and some of the technology, I believe there's some technology upgrades that we are going to be doing in the future. Can you just uh, briefly, I know we can't get detailed into the technology that we have in place, but just give us a brief overview of what is in place and what are some of the things that will be coming uh, in the months ahead? Uh, well, we, ha we do have an extensive... Um, uh, camera system that uh, has served us very, very well. Of course, that technology is probably about 10 years old at this point. And as all, all forms of technology, sometimes they become outdated. Uh, we do have um, a bond uh, planned with the state. We are uh, conducting the infrastructure, the wiring, et cetera. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, Intralogic uh, that has run this for virtually every, um, uh, every uh, district on Long Island at this point, um, helping upgrade some of those, um, some of our camera systems, you know, for the future. Um, so that's, that's in the, uh, in the implementation process at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. And that was the only question that I had. Uh, Mr. Coster, anything else that you would like to add before we open up any uh, comments or questions from the public on this public hearing portion of the William Floyd School District Draft Safety Plan? And uh, one last question for me, Mr. Stam, when uh, will the draft plan be on the school district website for public viewing? As soon as the, um, the, our next meeting is, is conducted, it's finalized, uh, really the next day we upload that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coster? Uh, President Becker, I'd just like to add that um, Mr. Stan toured every building in our district with a Homeland Security officer and members of the Suffolk County Police Department and received high, we received high marks across the board mm -hmm. for our security um, and the, the manner in which we operate our buildings on a daily basis. Um, Homeland Security was extremely complimentary and as Mr. Stan said, is using our plan as the model uh, for other big districts. Uh, we take next to school safety uh, school safety is, is obviously the most important thing that we worry about because if our, if our students can't be safe, our teachers can't be safe, how can they learn um, and academically and socially develop? So uh, Mr. Tamp said this will be on the, on the board uh, the day after the board meeting. It'll be public and uh, we look forward to feedback. Okay, so after the board adopts the draft plan on December 8th, then it goes on the public website for any comments or questions for a 30 day period after that. I'm just trying to understand the process. I'd like to interrupt the, the plan. The draft plan is currently on the website right now. We that's just, I, we, we right, just uploaded it. Okay. That's what I wanted to clarify that the draft plan is on the website. Now it'll stay open for a period of time so that the public has an opportunity to review the plan, make any comments or questions or concerns. Correct. And then, um, then you will bring the draft plan, uh, barring any other changes to the draft plan, uh, to the board at the December 8th meeting, correct? Correct. Okay, so folks are interested. The draft plan, Ms. Sedaris, you said is on the website at this present time. Okay, thank you very much. So just for the uh, members of the public, the draft plan is on the website for any questions, comments, or concerns over the next 30 days. That would be the time to send those in via email. And again, the email is cvisitin, V-I-S-I-N-T-I-N at wfsd.k12.ny.us. Okay. Um, if any member has any, uh, member of the public has any questions regarding that process at this point, uh, you could type them in the chat box and we'll allow for uh, a couple of minutes for anybody that wants to put anything in the chat box about the security plan. 
it's kind of tough to comment on it if you haven't seen it yet. But if you have any questions specifically about the process for this public hearing, now would be the time to ask. We'll just wait a minute or two for that. Okay, I'm seeing no questions or comments in the chat period. So at this point, we will uh, close this public hearing pending the 30 day uh, comment period at which time uh, on December 8th, 2020, the board is anticipated to take action in a resolution format of that school safety draft plan. Mr. Stamp, thank you for your efforts and thank uh, the entire security team for what they have done day in and day out for many, many years now. Uh, they have done a fabulous job on multiple occasions and we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. At this time, before we take a motion on our consent agenda, I'm going to turn the meeting over to our superintendent of schools, Mr. Coster, to address uh, some questions that we have been receiving and some concerns that we have been receiving concerning our plan to move ahead with uh, four day a week in person instruction, as opposed to the hybrid of the two day model that we currently have, which will start and take place on November 9th. So I'll turn the meeting over to Mr. Coster. After he completes his report to the board, the board will have an opportunity to ask any questions. Uh, and after the board is at an opportunity to ask any questions, again, we will take any questions or comments at members of the community that are online. Again, you go to the Zoom chat box and you can ask uh, or pose a question there. Okay, so Mr. Costa, it's all yours. Thank you, President Vecchio. So stage one was developed, as you know, after being out of school for three and a half months at the end of the last school year and then the two summer months. We were extremely concerned bringing back um, students and staff and decided on a hybrid model. After listening to the feedback from the community members, we added a virtual model before it was mandated that we had to add one. Um, I will tell you that the re-entry plan in stage one was necessary because we were not sure what we were facing, if we were gonna have another outbreak, if we were gonna be closed. It was necessary to keep our class sizes small uh, keep the six feet social distancing in place and have masks uh, worn. Um, necessary, but not optimal when you're dealing with children only receiving live instruction two days a week. So in stage two, we decided that we would look at our stage one model, consider feedback from our family who said that children were not leave, receiving enough instruction. And to be honest with you, President Vecchio and the public, uh, we have received 25 to one complaint ratio or concern ratio or feedback ratio on two days not being enough compared to wanting to keep the two day model of in person learning in K 8 that we have in place. We heard the vast majority of the concerns coming from elementary parents that were claiming that their students, their children were regressing. In the instance at Nathaniel Woodhull, when we had two closings. On a Monday, Tuesday, the students missed two weeks of in-person instruction. The model that we had set up had our teachers checking in for 40 minutes every day with our virtual students and then providing additional virtual reinforcement. The feedback overwhelmingly from the parents in the community was that 40 minutes was not enough. 40 minutes a day of instruction of live instruction was not enough. So we went to work based on the feedback that the Board of Education offered us, that our principals offered us, that our teachers offered us, that our teaching assistants offered us, and that our community offered us. The district is investing approximately $400,000 in virtual education upgrades and improvements, and it's training 15 new teachers that will be completely devoted to virtual students and the unique needs and concerns of their families. The district has spent the last few weeks training these new virtual teachers in district applications and are having them work with the grade level teachers right now to ensure a smooth transition. They will continue to work with the children's teachers in stage one, okay? They will continue to work with the children's teachers in stage one. We are not abandoning the stage one teachers. 
but the virtual instruction will be coming from these new virtual teachers on the elementary level. I don't think they could see me. Mrs. Sedaris, we have somebody that needs to be muted. Oh. There will be no, we are very happy to announce that the elementary students that are virtual with this change will have access to approximately 100 to 120 minutes daily of live instruction with their teacher versus the 40 minutes they received in stage one. There will be no change to special areas for art, music, and physical education. They will occur the same as they have in stage one. For parents of children who do not attend live instruction, the sessions will be recorded and posted on Google for the students to view at another time. Our virtual teachers will be communicating with families to introduce themselves and to provide information on when and how to log in to the Google Classroom and a meet the date, a meet the teacher, virtual teacher date will be set in the future. These changes have occurred in a very short time period and we needed to ensure we thoroughly considered each part of the transition, including staffing, training, and transitioning our virtual teachers. The district communication of this change was done directly to elementary school virtual families as this plan is geared toward elementary only with the hiring of 15 virtual teachers. We did target communication in this manner, so we did not confuse secondary parents, which would be middle school and high school parents. We understand that children do better with a routine, but we feel they will adapt quickly to the transition of a new teacher just eight weeks into the school year, and that the benefits of the additional instructional time outweigh any negatives caused by a change in routine. It was not an easy decision to make, but it was done with the best interest in mind of the children participating in virtual instruction based on a lot of communication and feedback from the community, our teachers, our TAs, our administrators, and of course, the Board of Education. If you have any further questions specifically requiring your, ch your child after this meeting has concluded, please reach out directly to your building principals as they will be in communication with my office and the secondary office, which is run by Assistant Superintendent Kathleen Keene, and the elementary office, which is run by Assistant Superintendent Stacey Scalisi. It is time to bring our students back and give them more than two days a week. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Koster. Um, I will start with Vice President Kapoler. Uh, any questions for Mr. Koster? No, and I appreciate the hard work that's gone into the planning of it, because I know there was a lot of input and um, it's gotta be successful for the kids. So we're going in the right direction. Thank you, Ms. Kapola. Trustee Gross. Uh, no questions here. Thank you for all your uh, work. Excellent. Trustee Tajani? No questions right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trustee Guerriero? Uh, no questions. And like everybody else, thanks so much for all you've done. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Mentz? Uh, no questions. And thank you. Trustee Casarino? No questions. Thank you uh, to Kevin and his team for all the hard work. Okay. Uh, Mr. Costa, just a few things to clarify and reiterate here. Can you talk to us about the, uh, I've heard concerns about the virtual teachers. Number one, we are not outsourcing the teachers. They are William Floyd employees, correct? Yes. Uh, we, uh, Mrs. Gilmore and our legal team, were very successfully able to negotiate some unprecedented language that the Board of Education had approved uh, to allow us to bring these members, these teachers in. They are part of the William Floyd School District. They are members of the William Floyd United Teachers Bargaining Unit. Um, and uh, I want to, I greatly appreciate the work that was done. Uh, and I greatly appreciate the collaborative nature of our teachers. I want to make sure that the public understands that we have collaborated with our teachers throughout this entire process. Okay. We have over 700 teachers and we took input from their elected officials including their building level representation, all the way up to their executive board to build this plan together, together to make sure that we're giving our kids more than they receive instructionally in stage one. 
Okay. And Mr. Costa, just uh, to stay on this point about the staff that are being appointed for the virtual teaching positions, uh, many of them were perm subs or uh, uh, subs within the district uh, that has stepped up. And, and we even had a couple of uh, other area teachers. So these were, uh, uh, many of them were already existing staff, if you will. Is that correct? That is correct. And I think that's very important that we we actively try to recruit those permanent subs because they already that are were already existing because they understand the cultures that they're building. They are familiar with some of the students already um, and definitely familiar with the teachers. Okay. Can you also talk about some of the additional measures that we've taken in the buildings because there's concern that now bringing everybody back uh, instead of the separated cohorts, we've se seen some uh, new cases pop up. You're seeing new COVID cases pop up around the country, around the state. What are some of the things that we did specifically ahead of time so that we could bring more students back into a classroom? Um, I know there's been concerns about the desk shields and uh, cleanings. Can you just reiterate some of the measures that we took and put in place uh, prior to this plan being uh, executed on Monday? Well, the first thing I'd like to do is publicly acknowledge the job that the facilities department under the leadership of Dave Baggins have done. Uh, being an educator for 25 years now, I've never seen a custodial and maintenance staff work harder uh, to address issues uh, immediately, uh, sanitizing buildings, using the PPE equipment that, were per that was purchased, uh, being on top of things when there has been an, a, a case where a classroom needs to be sanitized immediately, uh, they are doing that. And that is a huge part of why we've been successful. Uh, the other thing I would tell you is we have purchased desk shields, uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, the elementary desk shields are obviously different than the secondary desk shields. We don't have one specific type of desk um, in the district. So that was quite a challenge to turn that around in the time period. Uh, we have done work. As a matter of fact, uh, we toured a building yesterday, pulled out a consumable book and saw that we needed to widen the perimeter of the desk shield so the, the book could fit in there. We've spoken about non-traditional seating. In other words, moving rows around. So the student that is sitting in the, in the third row uh, is not being blocked by three other or two other desk shields. Uh, the principals are, are very, very aware of this. Um, we have offered desk shields uh, to anybody that's willing uh, to, to have a desk shield. Um, we ordered extra desk shields uh, at the elementary and secondary level. Uh, so that we could accommodate those uh, that just simply wanted a desk shield. Um, the, uh, the amount of, 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 of cleaning that's happening on a daily basis um, is, is really quite impressive. One of the questions that people have asked, and, and, and uh, are we gonna be six feet like we were in stage one? And the answer to that is, we are not gonna be six feet in all of our classrooms, but in any case that we've had, where uh, we've had to involve the Department of Health one of the first questions that we're getting are obviously the masks, are there desk shields, and then the square footage of the classroom, the ventilation, and the, and the special filters that have been put in and are running through our classroom. Um, so uh, we have taken every measure we can to try to make sure that these buildings are safe, our staff, our faculty are safe, as well as our students. Um, the other uh, thing I'd like to mention, uh, President Vecchio, is in the effect where I brought up Woodhull before, if we had to close Woodhull on a Monday, we could bring everybody back on a Tuesday. If we had to close Woodhull on a Monday and Tuesday, everybody comes back on a Thursday and a Friday. So they're not missing that instruction. We are keeping the Wednesday in place during stage two to make sure that this virtual opportunity continues to be enhanced on the secondary level and is successful on the elementary level. That's why we have kept the Wednesday in stage two. And I appreciate the support of the Board of Education in allowing that to happen. That was direct feedback from, my, from the assistant superintendents, Scalisi and Keene, from the teacher union, from the TA union, that these Wednesdays are crucially important. So we have decided to keep that so we can continue to make sure that the virtual students are getting what they need from their assigned teachers. And it's also to help make sure that the instruction is in alignment with what's happening in the classroom so that it's whether you're virtual or you're four days a week, it's, it's aligned. They're learning the same thing at the same pace, correct? 
Absolutely. That's why we brought these virtual teachers in early. They are working with their kindergarten, first grade, or second, third grade, or fourth, fifth grade, grade levels in each building. They're involved in meetings. They're asking questions. Um, and, you know, we really want to try to make this as seamless as transition as possible. These students have missed out on too much since March 13th, since we were closed. It's time to bring them back. It's time to give them what they deserve, which is instruction that they were accustomed to prior to the COVID pandemic. Okay. Uh, a couple other things here uh, based on feedback I've been receiving as well. Talk to me about what the expectation and what we can expect to see from the increased rigor of the virtual instruction. Obviously, you know, we had received some uh, constructive uh, comments about the um, delivery of the virtual. Uh, you've already indicated that we are more than tripling the actual instructional live time, if you will. Talk to us about uh, the rigor that we can expect compared to what was done prior. Well, the first thing that the families can expect is a, a live teacher that can answer questions based on immediate need during that block of time period, which is great, like you said, could be triple to what they received in the first stage. That was the first um, upgrade that I received from multiple parents in that if my child has a question on math that they are, that they, that they are completing, they have to wait to the next day to get into that 40 minute block. Now they have almost triple the opportunity uh, to do that. These virtual teachers are split between two grade levels, kindergarten and first grade, second grade and third grade, fourth grade or fifth grade, okay? So they're focused on that curriculum. The teachers in stage one gave every effort that they could during that 40 minute block. I personally observed them teach. I watched them try to do what they needed to do but they had to get back and teach five other periods that day to an A group for half the week and a B group for the second half of the week. Taking that responsibility um, or lessening that responsibility so that they can focus, um, number one, the virtual teachers can focus on their virtual students. And number two, the in-person teachers can focus on their in-person teacher, in-person students, is, I view is, is an upgrade and a potential win-win for everybody involved. I don't know so, if Dr. Scalisi has anything she wants to add uh, on that, Bob. Sure, Dr. Scalisi. Um, so I know, um, again, part of the question was about the, the rigor. Um, just to go back to this year, our teachers did a tremendous job uh, in a very short period of time of trying to navigate the technology. Our teachers know their curriculum, um, but how to navigate that into the technology has really been a stumbling block. We're getting better, but we're certainly not where we need to be. Um, and we certainly knew that as our parents were giving us the feedback and the staff was giving us the feedback, in a relatively short period of time, we have report cards, um, and it became apparently you know, pretty apparent that um, if we consider, we continue on the path that we have, we don't have enough information to really be able to assess the sciences, the social studies, um, and some of those other um, subject areas. So um, we, the team that we have, uh, we have a tremendous support team built in for the virtual teachers. We have uh, a tech team built in um, to help them quickly navigate any um, tech issues that are coming up, which we heard was certainly an issue um, across the district with the teachers who tried to log in and something was happening and they weren't sure. Um, so we have built a tech team specifically for these 15 teachers. Uh, the curriculum team we have is their grade level to make sure again their standards, they're teaching the same things that are happening in the classroom. And we actually have um, a mentor for the team that uh, is built just on the, um, the learning, uh, virtual learning aspect, because it's nothing that any of our elementary teachers have a, uh, a personal expertise in yet. So we have somebody else who's working with them to really, how do you do formative assessment? How do you, you know, how do we really evaluate students learning while it's online? So I do anticipate it to be a, a tremendous upgrade. We have tried to build it so that we are as flexible and as sensitive as possible um, to our communities. We have um, people who want more time, we have some who want less time. Uh, we had people that can't uh, you know, show up to the live, so they want us to be able to continue recording. So we're really just trying to listen to everyone's needs, but 
we really figured out in a short period of time that we just were not delivering the instruction that we needed to um, to our students. So I think you'll definitely see much more appropriate um, instruction that's probably a little bit more closely geared to what's actually happening in the classroom. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Mr. Coster, just a few more things and I hate to do this, but I just wanna bring up what we've been hearing uh, to try to address this. And again, this is being recorded. So uh, we'll be able to put this out there for folks to view after the fact. Um, talk to us about uh, grades nine through 11. I know uh, the plan starting on Monday is K through eight in our high school seniors. Uh, and obviously we've gotten some feedback from parents of students in grades nine through 11. Why not them? Uh, what was the thought process behind that? And what do we anticipate uh, going forward for grades nine through 11? So the, the decision to bring the seniors back as the first step is, is uh, pretty crystal clear uh, in our decision making. Uh, as juniors, they missed the last three and a half months of their school experience. And now they have missed the first uh, you know, two, two months and a week of their senior experience. Um, and the seniors, many of them uh, have late entry and they have early dismissal. Um, so it will give us a real good look at how we can stage bringing in more kids to an extremely large high school. Keep in mind that in the high school, we have well over 300 employees, probably close to 400 if you include uh, nighttime crew, um, and we have close to 3,000 students. Um, it's a very large building, and we need to tier in the approach uh, to bringing back 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, especially now that we've had uh, you know, an uptick in, in, in cases in the last couple of weeks um, where we want to be very, very sure that we, when we do bring back 2,800 students that we have given a very good test to what it looks like uh, with, you know, uh, you know a, a smaller population at first. You know, the high school is one building, okay? Um, and it houses, you know, a tremendous, tremendous population. The next group that would be coming back um, after the seniors would be our freshmen. Uh, we want to transition our freshmen back into our freshman academy. Freshman academy is a fairly segregated building. We will work through some of those details. Um, if the, and then after that, obviously, it'd be 10th and 11th grade. If we continue to keep a fairly steady level of infection rates in our community, um, and we are able to contact trace like we've done um, and we are able to communicate with the Department of Health like we've done and get information right away. Um, it is our goal to try to have our students, all of our students in high school back at the latest by New Year's 2021. Okay. Now there's a big asterisk there when it deals with the infection rate. Okay. So if we bring the seniors back and we see a big bump in an infection rate after Thanksgiving, like we are seeing potentially because of Halloween, then I'm gonna give the board that feedback and I will share that with the public. We wanna make sure that we are as safe as we possibly can bringing these students back. If we did not have 25 to 30% of our students virtual district-wide, we would not be able to bring K-8 back for um, four days a week and, and the high school bringing our seniors back. But because we have such a large virtual population, I feel comfortable that we will still have the conditions that we need to get our students back in. So speaking of the virtual population, uh, since we've announced this new plan of going to four days a week, uh, I know uh, the data has shown that we have seen more people switch from the full virtual to the four days than going from the two days to full, full virtual. Do we have a handle on uh, those numbers? Uh, or uh, a roundabout ballpark? I'd ask Dr. Scalisi first, and then uh, Assistant Superintendent Keene second to, to give you the data that they have. Okay, Dr. Scalisi. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, Bob, I, I don't have a percentage or a number. What I, what I can say um, is that the elementaries are probably pushing closer to the 30% than to the 25. Um, over the last um, two weeks, um, we have brought the, and, and certainly there was a concern, which, um, Part of the issue is has, ha, as we were developing the virtual teacher schedule and what does it look like if we had so many students, um, most of our classes now are, um, are probably the same size as a regular classroom now. So I can certainly get you the percentage or the numbers, but 
it, we are much, much lower than we were, um, you know, for, for uh, stage one. So what I would ask Dr. Scalisi at our December 8th board meeting, maybe we'll have you report out on the data as we'll have seen it. We'll have some really good numbers by then and average sizes for virtual, average sizes for in-person uh, across the primary level. And Ms. Keene, I guess we'll look at the same data. And then if you want to add anything else as well, please. Yeah, no, we, um, we'll, we'll pull that data and make sure you have the exact, um, but we did see a movement more um, from the virtual to the four day uh, than the other way around. Very few people uh, opted out of the hybrid. Most people opted in. So we'll get the specific numbers by building for you so that everyone can see uh, the full detail of that picture. Okay, and Ms. Keene, while we have you, uh, one of the other concerns is about uh, the delivery of food. Uh, we know certain buildings handle it a little bit differently as far as I know on the primary levels, food is delivered to the classrooms for the most part. Uh, and there's concerns about what steps we're taking when students are gathering in the cafeterias uh, over a Packer or at the high school. Talk to us about the steps that we're taking and also talk to us, uh, I guess, Ms. Keene, we'll start with you and Dr. Scalisi, uh, as far as the compliance that we've had with our students regarding masks and hygiene and social distancing, what the observation has been since we've been open as well. Sure. Um, we'll start with the lunchrooms. Both middle schools, um, due to the nature of the number of students who uh, were eating lunch at the different periods, we do utilize the cafeterias in both buildings. They are six feet apart eating in their individual desks, uh, which will continue um, and we will um, you know, keep monitoring that. Um, when we bring back the additional students, we'll be utilizing those spaces plus other large spaces and um, classrooms. So there'll be an expansion of the lunch period so that we don't ever move beyond or closer than six feet while students are eating. So that is definitely the way the middle schools, the high school did uh, change their schedule 100% and put lunch all eighth period. So they will be eating in classrooms. So at the high school level, they do eat in classrooms. We are not using the cafeterias at this point, and we do not intend to for the remainder of the school year uh, based on the way we've uh, designed that. Um, as far as our students, I think it's been uh, truly amazing how compliant and uh, you know, respectful they are of, of them, you know, for themselves, their own safety and for others. So we haven't seen any, um, you know, any, you know, most students, if they, if they do take a break, break, they put it right there, put their mask right back up. If they tend to have it behind their nose, it just takes a quick reminder and, and the mask is back, back up. Social distancing is not an issue where uh, different uh, buildings have one-way hallways. Students are all very compliant. Um, so I think we're, you know, for our students and our faculty have done an amazing job and continue to even as it's a long haul. So I haven't seen any even slip in that, which is making me very positive for what it's gonna look like when we bring back four days. I think everyone's kind of acclimated and ready for school looks different, but we're okay with it and we're happy to be in school. Great. And Dr. Scalise, if you just want to talk about the food delivery service for the uh, primary levels. Sure. Um, so most of you know that the breakfasts are delivered directly to the classrooms in the morning uh, or, you know, maybe in a few of the grade levels, there might be a grab and go card um, as they're heading into the rooms. Um, we have, we are primarily eating out of the classrooms. We do have a couple of buildings that if there's at a grade level, maybe this, uh, Two, four classes on a grade level, two of them might be in their rooms and two of them may be in the cafeteria. So, um, you know, we have really minimized any use of the cafeteria um, to the extent possible. Um, and I have to say what Kathleen said, uh, I concur with the masks. Our students have been amazing. Uh, we, you know, were worried about stamina. We were worried about kindergarten children and they came in uh, and it's a, it seems typical to them at this point. Um, we do have some students with disabilities who for more sensory issues, um, you know, that they, we may opt to take their mask off and keep them six feet, uh, again, just based on um, some more of their disability issues. Um, most of you know, we also have, um, you know, when we have students with severe disabilities who from a sensory perspective um, or behavioral perspective uh, can't keep it on, um, you know, with a doctor's note, we have a, you know, a, a process to approve that. We have an extremely few 
um, students who are even in that boat. Very few. I could probably count on my hand. So I have been very impressed with the students and, and their adherence to the mask practices. Great. Thank you. Ms. Gilmore, I'm going to turn to you with a few questions. Uh, Ms. Gilmore is the assistant soup for human resources, but she's also our point person for COVID. Um, uh, Ms. Gilmore, can you take us through the process of when the district is notified of a positive case, either notification from a parent or directly from the Department of Health? What are the steps uh, that we take as far as uh, assessing and working with Department of Health. And I just want to say also the Department of Health has been tremendous. And I think kudos goes to the entire uh, County Department of Health, even going back to last March to present. They've been extremely responsive. They've been extremely uh, collaborative with us. And, and I just want to compliment their work with our school district uh, since the shutdown and since our reopening. Uh, but Ms. Gilmore, just for the public's uh, purposes, because this question came up uh, last night and this morning, as far as, you know, the decision-making process, how we're notified and the steps that are taken. Sure. So the first thing we do to get a case activated, once we know there's a positive test is we go into a portal through Suffolk County and we enter that information that triggers, um, one of the, um, health, uh, nurses to contact us. So that's the first thing we do while we, once we do that, we get a, we literally get a spreadsheet. Um, and then we start working with the impacted employee or student to gather data to assess, um, you know, how many periods might be impacted, how many teachers, how many employees. And obviously it changes depending upon who tests positive. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty intense process, Kathleen uh, and, and Stacy. really. The three of us work together to make sure we get everything completed. Um, as quickly as possible to get that information so we can start the contact tracing. Depending on the circumstances, and every case is very, very different. So we assess the exposure. It's all um, a point system that we, we understand now how many points you get, depending on whether a window was open, masks were on, were people eating. There's a, de a room density formula that's built right into the um, spreadsheet. So you actually literally have the measurements of the room, the height of the ceiling. Um, they ask you what kind of filters you have, how many people were in the room. And all of that gets compiled into a document. Now we work simultaneously with the building administrators. Um, you know, we might be working with transportation at that point. So there's a whole team of people that's kind of doing the initial contact tracing to see what, you know, who may have been impacted. Then once we gather that, we work with the Department of Health. Um, we literally go line by line, person by person to assess whether or not someone needs to be in quarantine. Um, and, you know, they, in the end, they will let us know um, who, whether it's a staff person, whether it's students, um, and, you know, those people are then quarantined, but we're working with them the entire time. So it's, you know, it, They've been very responsive to us. I think my colleagues would, would say we speak to them on weekends and evenings and, um, you know, because they understand that their decisions impact our ability to, you know, quarantine or not quarantine. Sometimes out of an abundance of caution, if we get a case late in the day. Um, so, for example, you know, maybe it's four o'clock we hear about a case. We may keep people home until we have time to work through all of that, um, the assessment with the Department of Health and with our own staff. So, um, you know, I, really we work as a team and, and very closely with Department of Health to make those decisions. Great. And um, I don't know if you have the exact numbers, but how many cases have we sure. had since September? And if you could break it down, cases with staff, Yep. Cases with students, please. Sure. So we've had, since September, we've had 23 cases. Um, we've had 15 students and eight employees. And of the 15 students, there were a couple students because of the required reporting. Some of those students of those cases were virtual, were they not? Uh, I think at least, Kathleen, help me. I think one, I know one for sure and possibly two. But we ha we still have to report yes. that case, yes. uh, even though they were never in the building because they're 100% yes. virtual, but yeah. we're required when to we, report. Yep. A actually, the beginning of the school year, um, we even had an employee who 
we needed to report but had not been in the school. So I would say at least one employee, and I think there was one or possibly two students early on that were virtual students. So, yeah, and there have been other cases where there's been no contact in the school, but we still report it, um, make sure that we have the dates and the timelines right. Um, but there's been many, there's been cases that have had no impact on um, our operation at all. And Ms. Gilmore, we haven't seen a particular cluster in any building or grade level uh, with the 15 student cases in particular, correct? No, we, we've been looking at that closely. Um, we look for, you know, if there's any kind of um, co-mingling of students and then and, and the Department of Health, um, one of the first questions they ask you when you have a new case, are these one of the kids or employees that may have been quarantined from another case? So um, it's sort of been spread out throughout the district, um, but we are, you know, very aware of that as well as the Department of Health if we see a cluster. Great, thank you. And and I'm nearing the end of uh, my questions and uh, for all of you, uh, Mr. Costa, I'm going to turn back to you. Two things: one, uh, take us through the process of the decision making process, whether to close a building or not close a building. Uh, when we do have a positive case. I know there's a lot of collaboration and recommendations with the Department of Health and take us through the decision-making process because we had some questions. Well, you closed PACA, but you didn't close another building. Just take us through the process of when the decision to close. And I know it's very individualistic and each it's case by case, but take us through the process, if you will. So first of all, um, you are 100% correct. It is an absolute collaborative effort from the building to district office, to the Department of Health, to the Board of Education. Um, when we close a building, we close a building because we don't have enough information as to whether or not we can keep our faculty and students and staff safe. That was the case with PACA, as you had mentioned. We had a positive case, a late test on a Friday afternoon, a closure of an office on Saturday, no feedback on Sunday, no feedback until later in the day on Monday, which is why we decided to make the close. In a case like Woodhull's closing, um, people want, or the Department of Health wants reasonable assurances that um, the, uh, the member of the, of the staff that had the uh, uh, a positive case was you know, segregated to one location of the building. And if, I can't give that assurance because of the fact that People go to faculty rooms at times. People are in the bathrooms at times. People are in the office at times. People may take mass breaks. So we don't have enough information. Collectively, as a team, we have our own system in which we make a determination we need a day. Now, in a case like the high school, we, high school has had when we remained open, we had Department of Health feedback based on the matrix that Mrs. Gilmore explained, based on the contact tracing that was done between Mrs. Keene, Mrs. Gilmore, and additions from Principal Scotto and his team. And we were told by the Department of Health that we were in, in good standing at that point, okay? So every single case is different. We have had cases where you've had a sibling in one building test positive, and then a day later, a sibling in another building test positive. Those count as two positive cases, but it's one family, okay? So we are constantly dealing with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Last Sunday, as you know, I was on the phone with you. I was on the phone with uh, Vice President Coppola. I spoke to every board trustee to make sure they knew on Sunday where our mindset was. It's not made in isolation, okay? We have, um, you know, in the case of last Sunday, three assistant superintendents, the director of public relations, the confidential secretary, seven board members involved, and we have a communication plan that gets put out. Starts with the Board of Education. The decision does not get made without input from the Board of Education. From there, we communicate with the bargaining unit presidents. They're elected as leaders of their groups, okay? So that's teachers, TAs, administrators, nurses, custodial, head custodial, uh, district office clerical, clerical, and then from there, all administrators receive the same email. We give them time to process, and then it goes out to all William Floyd staff. So everybody's made aware, okay? From there, um, it goes to um, the public, um, you know, in, in a, uh, either a school messenger, if a school is closing, or 
an email that is remains on our website flash so that people can view it publicly. Um, so it is, it is quite a, a large task with a lot of feedback from some very intelligent, knowledgeable people. It is not made in isolation. And I'm gonna be honest with you, closing buildings, although it's necessary at times, is not what our priority is. We have worked very, very, very hard to keep our buildings open um, because our kids need to be here. Our kids need to receive instruction. Our kids need to receive, need to receive uh, the, the, their breakfast and their lunch. Um, so we take this, this decision very, very seriously, Bob. Thank you very much. Lastly, uh, for you, Mr. Coster and Mr. Beggins, I have a question for you afterwards. Uh, give us an updated status on the back orders of Chromebooks. Okay, I will uh, uh, actually, since Kathleen Keene is in charge of technology for the district uh, and works uh, directly with Rob Lavinia, our coordinator of technology, uh, I will ask her to give you that update. Um, I will tell you that um, as far as distribution of uh, Chromebooks, our district office staff has been doing a magnificent job. We are turning out Chromebooks still, although our stockpile has dwindled um, drastically, we are still giving them out. Um, there is a whole process in place, very organized. We did receive many, many, many more Chromebooks back than we initially reported when we were out over a thousand. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we are trying to get them out, but Ms. Keene can definitely give you uh, an update on where we stand, uh, being that one of her many responsibilities is instructional technology. Ms. Keene. Yeah, so the uh, the orders that we have outstanding, uh, there there's several different buckets of orders which have each have different um, timelines. Um, the one that we had our largest order, which was I think 3,000, 3,500, something like that. Um, we were feeling pretty good that they would be coming in November, and then they were saying November, December, and now they just said just today we got the update. Uh, it is November, December, but it's a partial order. So we will not be getting the full 3000, but we will be getting a bulk. Um, I think that the number was around 700, but I could uh, make sure for the next meeting that we I have a full update on that. Um, we, um, we have uh, gotten any Chromebook or or device we could find in any part of the building to add to our supply to get them out, which is why we still have some on hand. So as, if we can turn some around, we get them back out as soon as possible. So it's still uh, a challenge here, but um, the team is working to communicate and give more to families as needed. Getting back in school is gonna help though. Sure, and what is the total number of outstanding Chromebooks that were distributed last year at this point approximately? Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, the number that we've given out total? No, the number that were never returned from last year. As Mr. Coster said, it was as high as 900, almost a thousand dwindled down quite a bit. Yeah, uh, I think we're, I think we're in the, the low hundreds, but James looks like he knows. 241. Oh, 241. 241. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Beggins, uh, my question for you, uh, Mr. Coster had mentioned a couple of times about the uh, filters and uh, can you uh, one, uh, give us an update on the installation of what they call, I believe the MERV filters and uh, what their purpose is and what they do and, and just take us through uh, as far as the installation of those filters throughout the district in our district buildings. Mr. Beggins. I see that he's on Bob. Not sure yeah. If you have a issue. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Costa, just give us a brief overview. Uh, I know we have invested in the recommended type of filters to be installed per CDC and State Department of Health and the Department of Health. And either you can answer or maybe uh, Ms. Gilmore can answer. Uh, but my overall question is are all the filters installed in all the buildings district wide? Uh, yes, we, we any any filtration system that can take that type of filter, which is the vast majority of our filters, because as you know, we have uh, uh, have undergone upgrades. Um, do have the the, the MERV filters, uh, which, as Mrs. Gilmore indicated before, 
is one of the questions that is almost always asked by the Department of Health. Uh, we invested in those uh, over the summer, as you know, uh, as part of our initial reentry plan, and we will continue to make sure that they are utilized and changed uh, throughout this pandemic. Okay, great. And as far as the desk shields, um, I know I had the opportunity to tour Hobart yesterday because uh, we had heard some concerns about the shields themselves. Uh, and while you can get books inside the space that the shield is around the desk, obviously, if we widen them, it'll be a little bit better for the students. But it's to be noted that the shields are completely clear. There's no borders. They're completely clear plastic. So uh, while you may see a glare or whatever, there's no obstructed view for the smart boards for students in different positions in the classroom, particularly at the elementary levels. I'll speak for Hobart. That was the building I toured. Uh, we had heard some concerns about that, uh, but after seeing them firsthand, uh, I can understand some of the concerns, but they're really very clear and you could see through. And I think with the positioning of the desks, it should work out uh, pretty well. Uh, do we have any outstanding orders or are we still waiting on them or do we have all the uh, shields that we anticipated for Monday's opening? As far as I know, we are completely set and we have a stockpile if necessary in each of the buildings. Um, we, uh, like I had indicated earlier, there's a couple things that have to happen. Um, number one, number two, uh, we, we have to make sure that the specific type of desk, there's three, several different types of desks at the high school and they were working yesterday, Principal Scotto and Assistant Principal Pisano were working yesterday to try to make sure that each one of these shields was properly fastened to the desk. So it is a major concern and a priority as we're welcoming back our students. Uh, we do have everything <coughs> in. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on that. All of our desk shields are in um, and we, they are being uh, fastened as we speak. Um, and we will be ready to go come Monday, November 9th for, for stage two re-entry. Great, and I think uh, we've- Kevin, I just the want to reiterate- Mr. Baggins? Yep, I just wanted to reiterate that what Kevin said. All the elementaries have already just been distributed and set up. Um, most of the middle schools are completely done, and the high school is still working through some of the ancillary classrooms. We do have additional shields, and we'll probably be ordering some backup just in case additional kids do come in and we actually need to replace any broken items. Thank you, Mr. Baggins. Okay, that is all that I have, and I and I'm thank you for indulging me. But these were a lot of the comments, questions, or concerns we were hearing or seeing, and I figured take advantage of the opportunity of having everybody here so that uh, we could get those questions answered. And again, this session is going to be recorded, so folks can refer back to it. Um, any uh, other questions from any board members based on some of the things that we've heard, uh, Ms. Capola? No, I think you've covered uh, most of it. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Uh, no, none, none from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiani. Nothing here. Mr. Guerriero. No, good luck on Monday. Looking forward to it. And I, and I will say the staff that I spoke with at Hobart are really pumped. And as teacher after teacher told me, and literally this is one of the first things they said, they can't wait to get their kids back in their classroom. Uh, so they're, they're very excited. They're prepared. They're ready and the teaching staff with how they have pivoted multiple times uh, since the closure in March and the opening in September and now this new change. Uh, kudos to them, kudos to the uh, buildings and grounds and custodial staff and our security staff uh, and the clerical staff and the transportation. Uh, everybody's done a really amazing job. And on behalf of the Board of Education, Mr. Costa, to you and to the entire team, the district office, the building administrators, uh, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Casarino, any questions? None here. Mrs. Mentz? Uh, no question. I think you covered everything that we had all been hearing. Okay, great. At this point in time, um, I will uh, take a look at the chat area to see if any members of the public have any questions or comments. Um, I'll allow a couple of minutes for folks if you want to enter a comment or a question into the Zoom group chat. Um, I see uh, Lee's iPad has a few questions, so just type your questions in.
or actually Ms. Sedaris, are we able to unmute Lee's iPad? And I'm going to ask folks to direct their questions to me, Bob Vecchio, and then we'll see who needs to answer it. So uh, Ms. Sedaris, just give me a thumbs up if her iPad is unmuted. If you can see that, if that's possible. Okay, that is actually me, Mrs. Daly. I'm sorry? That's actually me, Mrs. Daly. Oh, Mrs. Daly, it just shows up as Lee's iPad. Sorry. So Mrs. Daly, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. It just took a little bit longer for me to write it as opposed to say it. No problem. Um, I do want to start off by saying thank you to everyone for all of the efforts being made because it's been, it's all of the teachers, everyone working with our students. It's been phenomenal. Everyone's been working tirelessly and I completely understand that. I do have a few questions. Um, as far as the feedback goes, the only information I had seen was whether or not we were willing to send our children back or keep them stay, uh, to stay virtual. So I wasn't sure where that feedback actually came from as far as the plan moving forward. The um, second question would be moving forward with this plan. I know it was talked about the children are very adaptable and they've been doing very well. And I feel like with this next stage in place, they've finally just gotten their footing with the previous stage. So virtual children are now understanding what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be doing it and getting a gist of it. With this next stage, they're being uprooted. And we weren't really, it feels almost last minute we we're being told that these are our two options and the virtual children are now being uprooted out of their classroom, their teacher, and moving forward with stage three, they're gonna be uprooted again because the ultimate goal is for them to be in school. So I'm just not sure what, this stage, they've already adapted to the previous stage. Now they have to readapt and then readapt. And how is that conducive to um, a full and appropriate education that assures them the effectiveness of these efforts being made? Because there are efforts being made. I just don't see the effectiveness being there. There's children that are gonna be left behind because a virtual classroom is completely different than an in-person classroom. I think everyone can say that. So for there to be 20 or what was the number? I 25 covered. to 30%. 20. Okay. That's a full virtual classroom. And with a son with special needs, some of his virtual sessions are three children and people are struggling. So to be able to comprehensively extend these lessons to these children and have them adapt and have them not regress because they have been regressing because the lessons science as you said and social studies have not been being taught to children who aren't attending in school which i'm just wondering how that's going to be implemented because to my knowledge that's not in the plan there's an allotted time for math there's an allotted time for ela and then a possible question and answer i mean hopefully you can answer that how these children aren't supposed to feel uprooted and set aside with an appropriate uh, and full expectation of this education not being uh, thrown into it time and time again. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to mute you for a second so we could address those few points so we don't forget some of them and then I'll come back to you, I promise. So the first thing that I'm going to say is none of this is optimal uh at all right four day as opposed to five days not optimal full virtual is not optimal it's important to note that uh we do uh fall under a governor executive offer, uh, order that mandates us to offer full virtual right and that is the mandate from the state that we have to comply with number one um so until that mandate is lifted uh we don't know what the next stage or steps will be but what i will say from a perspective as a board member, we knew two things. One, that the in-person hybrid model left a lot of room for growth and we felt that children were falling really far behind. And given that our numbers stayed as low as they have, uh, like Ms. Gilmore stated, we've had 23 cases, 15 of them students. We have about 8,800 students in the district. So that's those are some really low numbers. Eight staff, we have about 1,500 staff members. Uh, so that's something that we've been paying very close attention to. And it was because of what we were hearing, what some board members as parents were 
also experiencing firsthand. Uh, those of us that don't have children in the school, believe me, <laughs> it was tough shopping in the, you know, any supermarket locally without hearing the feedback about what was going on for the in-person hybrid model. We knew we, we always had the mindset that as soon as we could ramp it up, we would with our reopening plan. And we felt that when we opened up in September, we weren't sure what it was going to look like if cases were going to spike really high, if the governor was going to shut us down again. Um, I think there were some betting pools out there that you know gave us 30 days before we would be shut down statewide. So there was a lot of unknown in September. Um, once we got our feet wet, so to speak, and once the data with the infection rates were pretty solid after several weeks, we knew we had to take another step forward for the hybrid model. And we felt confident that getting the kids from two days to four days was A, appropriate, B, the right time to do it based on the numbers, even with the recent numbers that we've had, uh, that was critically important. On the same token, we knew it was extremely important to increase the level of live instructional time for the virtual students. Uh, as Mr. Costa alluded to, 40 minutes compared to what will be going forward to 120. Uh, without a doubt, we know the increased live instructional time is going to be extremely beneficial for the students that are fully virtual. We do understand the concern as far as if kids got used to a certain teacher uh, on a virtual level, and now they're going to have another teacher. Uh, but the one thing that we have learned with students over the many years, I'm on the board 17 years now, is kids adapt a lot quicker than our own adult mindsets do. Uh, and I use as an example, many years ago, we redistricted our elementary buildings. And people who were used to going to Floyd L were now all of a sudden going to Woodhull. And it was great turmoil, but the kids adapted very quickly. We had to weigh out the benefit versus the, the, the pros versus the con. And the pro here is that there's going to be a lot more live instruction given, a lot more rigorous instruction given virtually versus the change from the person that they've been used to for about an eight-week period to compared to what they're going to get going forward. And we, felt, we feel... Uh, as, as a total team that it is far better to increase the level of instructional time, increase the rigor of the instructional time far outweighs the connection with the teacher that they may have made over the eight weeks. We are confident with the staff that has been, we're about to appoint them. That's the reason we had the special meeting tonight to appoint all these folks. Uh, and these are not unknown entities to the district. That's why we said very early on that the vast majority of these virtual teachers have been perm subs in our buildings, which means uh, it's not just a substitute that's in, you know, a day here or a day there. Perm subs are usually in every day. So they know our buildings, they know our kids. And, they know, and more importantly, they're known entities to us as far as uh, educators. Uh, and that was critically important. And even some teachers in, in certain areas wanted to sign up and become virtual instructors. So we're pretty confident that we have a great team of uh, teachers who are going to be delivering the instruction. Uh, and that was critically important for us. So that is why um, we decided to take that step. As far as the feedback goes, uh, uh, we were getting raw feedback just from, like Mr. Costa said, the complaints. And we knew we had to change. We knew that we were running out of our goodwill with, with our uh, I, 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 call, I call them our clients, our customers, which is you and, and the students because we're customer service minded here in this district. We knew we had to change. The data was showing us we had to change. High school guidance counselors are seeing more kids that are on a roll students with social and emotional issues than ever before. And that tells us what we had in place was fine for the reopening when everything was unsure, but we also knew we had to make some uh, halftime adjustments for lack of a better phrase. And we knew that based on the infection rate data, we were able to take a step forward and this was the next step. Um, the other thing that you had mentioned, um, and we can unmute Ms. Daly again. Um, science and social studies. Science and social studies. So uh, Dr. Scalisi, uh, I'm gonna mute you again, uh, Ms. Daly, just so that Dr. Scalisi could respond to that question. Thank you, Mr. Coster. Uh, so uh, one of the things also I, I just wanted to say um, is when I'm looking um, at 
uh, at, at a particular building, we have um, class sizes on paper uh, for virtual that range from, um, at Tangier Smith, for example, from 20 to 27. Um, and that is not necessarily with the students who are actively logging in. I'm sure there'll be more than three kids logging in at a time, um, but I, I don't think the numbers um, are going to be anywhere near where we were initially thinking they would be for stage one. Um, unfortunately, um, as we've said before, many of our students um, are unable to log in um, at a specific time and they do log in later on um, with, you know, with the support of their parents and then watch um, the, the videos or recordings. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to bring out is that what we're hopeful for um, that we will be able to do with the extended time is um, just like a, a classroom teacher in elementary doesn't teach 120 minutes straight. Um, to the whole class. They typically will do a mini lesson uh, and the students will be off doing independence and the teacher then will go back to, you know, into group. So uh, we are working with our virtual teachers so that they can, um, you know, create small chats um, so that they can also do small group instruction. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I certainly heard the question about science and social studies, but uh, we are also looking at how do we do a much more, if they don't have the specific supplies and materials at home, uh, what programs can we do to make sure, because we are still required to meet the science standards um, and the social study standards. Right now, through the 40 minutes, um, we, we've asked the teachers at best to integrate, to you know, make sure that the materials that they're using to the best extent um, you know, can be science or social studies related, and we want to be able to give them a much more um, robust opportunities. We're looking at programs that have virtual labs. Um, so again, um, there's so many things in elementary, although we concentrate on the, the math and the ELA, um, there are other building blocks that we certainly have to give them. And Mrs. Daly, I don't know if I answered your science and social studies question, um, but I certainly wanted to just um, make sure that that is certainly something that we're going to have to work better toward for stage two, and that the group sizes I don't think will be as, um, as large as we're thinking. And the group sizes are going to be typical to average class sizes in our buildings if everybody was in five days a week, correct, Ms. Calise? Yeah. Bob, okay. I believe Ms. Daly mentioned something about um, potentially a special needs or requiring extra assistance, but I would encourage any parent that has a question regarding that uh, on the elementary level, reach directly out to Dr. Scalisi after you speak to your principal. On secondary level, uh, Ms. Keene, Kathleen Keene, after you speak, uh, to your principal, or if your child has a guidance counselor, uh, maybe that would be the first step because we do not want to lose those students. Um, and I, one of the things that we really pushed for in adding these times back, uh, you know, these days back were exactly what, what was just shared and that we really want to get back to um, looking into what virtual science looks like. On the elementary level, science is extremely hands-on. They are science kits. Um, and that it presents a challenge for a fully virtual student. So we are looking at those experiencing experiences being online as an addition to what stage two and even stage three could look like. You know, uh, we went from being completely shut down, as you know, uh, to bringing kids back. And there were many, many people around New York State saying, we give you till the end of September, you will be shut down completely again. And you know, uh, through a lot of lot of good work in our region, and definitely a lot of good work in our school district, um, and a lot of, of work on the on the part of our our, our employees and our students, um, we have been able to to remain open. The questions about masks, the questions about PPE equipment, the questions about how do we get ten thousand or more desk shields in, are being answered and being accomplished because we're working together as a team. But I do not want any parent who has specific questions about their child's needs not being met to feel like they're being left behind, whether they are virtual or in person, we will make every effort to work to make sure that, that, that we are enhancing that program. Um, Kevin, if I could, if I just could add, sure. um, so I definitely, so, and, and by modeling it this way, if we need to get um, right a, a reading specialist or if we need um, extra language support, this model will better allow for us to focus that um, we have some wonderful teaching assistants who have been very well trained. Um, so, so this model will allow us to better target. So it's incredibly important that you talk to your, your, your teacher or if you're more comfortable, go to your principal um, and you know, for, for supports that we need. And we've also heard from, you know, not, not many, but one or two parents that um, from a social emotional perspective, um, we need to do a little bit more support with them for transitioning. Um, and that, uh, again, the principals working with those teachers um, on those particular student issues just to make sure that 
you know, for this child, maybe, maybe a week's transition or two weeks transition isn't enough. Maybe, you know, we're going to ask the classroom teacher to kind of, you know, have a daily check-in or, you know, everything will be much more individualized. So, but it's incredibly important that you reach out to your building administration if you're, if you feel your child needs that and they are, have been incredibly welcoming and um, will certainly do whatever, you know, whatever they can do to, to help. Great. Thank you, Dr. Scalise. And Ms. Daly, if you have uh, other comments or questions, just raise your hand. I could see you on the screen uh, and we'll unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Sedaris, please unmute Lee's iPad. There you I go. think I did echo. Is there an echo? Uh, there's a big echo, yeah. Okay. Much better. better. Much better. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I do have a question. I have two questions, I think, because you guys are doing really well answering a few of my, my points. Um, one of the questions that I haven't touched on yet, when there is a quarantine or someone does need to quarantine for the 14 days or the school shuts down or something of the sort, what happens with the virtual children who have to reintegrate with their teacher? Is, are they back with their regular teacher during this quarantine 14 days? Okay, so if they're in school, They'll, they'll be they'll be with the same virtual that'll be their teacher so if if we're shut down the in-person teachers will then switch over to virtual and educate the kids in their class that are assigned to them and the virtual teachers will it there's no impact right it, it'll just be another day for them is okay. that correct mr costa i just want to make sure i didn't misspeak he's nodding his head yes so we're good go ahead anything else miss daly yes go ahead Oh, there we are. Sorry. Okay. Also, um, you had touched on it a lot and I, I'm still, I don't know if it's just because my children are virtual and I'm not understanding it. Why not it try and make a plan that does incorporate? I know everyone's accommodating the teachers and the parents who want to be back, but that seems like you're kind of just leaving these children behind who do need to stay virtual for whatever reason that they have. Why not try and incorporate that into transitioning continuously instead of constantly having to adapt with each stage. Why not incorporate those programs, so science and and, and uh, social studies via, obviously not synchronous learning, but via some type of link or some type of pre-recorded uh, video as opposed to the emotional and mental instability that that kind of provides when they're already going through a pandemic at eight years old. Mm -hmm. So again, like Dr. Scalisi alluded to, that we will try to incorporate the sciences and, and do the same with the social studies. Uh, and again, by switching to somebody who is just focused on virtual instruction, more concentrated as opposed to splitting time with in-person and virtual, uh, we'll be able to do and have greater capacity to expand the offerings there. So I'm confident that uh, as we move forward with this, you know, everything's baby steps uh, since March, right? So the first baby step is bring those who are coming two days a week that need four, we'll bring them back to the four and then expand and get a concentrated effort uh, to expand the virtual learning. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, this is a huge, huge investment that the district has made. And, and that's why we're committed to it on the virtual side. We're uh, tonight's agenda, we're hiring a whole bunch of people as virtual teachers. And that's a huge uh, investment dollar wise that we didn't anticipate in our budget, but we knew we had to do it and we're happy to make that investment. So that's why by taking this baby step of having dedicated virtual teachers, we know that the virtual program uh, will get better and we will incorporate and continue to take steps forward to make sure that they are not being left behind and they're not viewed as other type of students. And we're and that's why we're still being closed on Wednesdays so that we can ensure alignment with the grade levels so that the virtual students are aligned with the in-person students as well so that everybody, at least, you know, the education delivery may be different, but the education that's being delivered will be uh, equitable. Is that a fair statement, Mr. Coster? Yes, it is. I, I would just like to point out too, uh, we've gone from packet distribution, paper packet distribution to virtual instruction um, to now hiring virtual teachers um, in a, an extremely expedient time period. And if, if we've shown anything to the district by listening to our constituents and trying to work to develop a program, I'm very excited to see where these virtual teachers 
can take the program along with being assisted by a master teacher who is their mentor, classroom teachers that they will collaborate with and a very, very strong building level team. So we have really since March um, come a very, very long way in modernizing what we're offering. Again, I understand a lot of, of the concerns that I've received, um, you know, and we are listening to those concerns and we will try to assist if there are transition issues. That's why on the elementary level, since the question came from the elementary level, we have a psychologist, a social worker and a guidance counselor in every building. Um, and I'm sure that um, if there is an issue uh, that that can definitely be worked out with a, a, a in, in a case, uh, Ms. D Ms. Daly, I believe your your children attend Tandra Smith. Um, so in in, um, in in being that, you know, we, we will be able to offer that assistance on a case by case basis. So, and if I'm understanding your question that you typed in here, Ms. Daly, going back to school, will children be reintegrated into their class? So are we talking about the two cohorts now combining? Uh, so if cohort A and cohort B are now going to the four days a week, are they going to have the same teachers? Is that the question? The virtual also. Oh, virtual. So the virtual students will have the virtual teacher, the dedicated virtual teacher, right? Uh, the cohorts, obviously, the A, B students will now have the same teacher and a bunch of new friends in their class, if you will. Uh, but if and when the point in time comes where uh, the governor's executive order says we can get away from the mandate of offering full virtual and now everybody is now coming back five days a week and there is no virtual option, uh, we will definitely have to come up with a plan as far as transitioning on how we're going to do that. Um, to be honest with you, just my opinion only, I don't think the executive order from the governor will be lifted this school year as far as mandating school districts to offer full virtual for the, the remainder of this school year. That's just my own opinion based on knowing this governor and how he's acted so far with this uh, uh, shutdown and the directives that he's given. But if he does lift that, uh, we will be very deliberate, very cautious in how we do that. If we have these teachers on staff, and I'm just thinking, just based on your question, you know, well, you know, we'll have to look at space, number one, and how we transition kids back into the classrooms that it should have been if there was no pandemic. But honestly, uh, I don't see the full virtual option mandate by the governor being lifted uh, before the end of June but I could be wrong, but I, I think common sense will say that this will probably be in place uh, the remainder of the year. Mr. Coster. Yeah, Bob, I actually mentioned, uh, asked that question to our, our, our district attorney, uh, Mr. Craig Levo, and he actually offered the opinion uh, exactly to what you had just said. So uh, while building this, this second stage, we, we really wanted to make sure that all of a sudden we were not gonna have the rug pulled out from underneath us in stage three. Um, and I, I, I have never received anything but great guidance from our attorneys. Um, so I am very confident that what you just said is the reality that there will be virtual schooling for the remainder of this school year. Great. Mr. Olivo, did you want to elaborate on that? Uh, Mr. Olivo is our school attorney from okay. Bon Shonick and King, an impressive and uh, great, great law firm. I can't sing their praises enough. They've been wonderful since the shutdown with giving us guidance and paying attention to what's going on in Albany as laws and mandates have changed uh, by the hour. So Mr. Oliva. Yeah, uh, Bob and, and Kevin, both of you are absolutely correct. Uh, I do not foresee any real possibility that um, eliminating the virtual option uh, will occur this school year. Um, if anything, uh, unfortunately, given the trend that we're seeing around the country and, and even here on Long Island, I, I think we uh, may unfortunately find ourselves uh, in a full virtual uh, world at some point later this year. So um, you're correct. We, we, we hope we don't get shut down again, but we'll be prepared for whatever scenario. Okay, Ms. Daly, have uh, we covered all your questions? I think so, yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna ask that Lee's iPad be muted again, great. Uh, any other uh, community residents with any other questions, uh, just 
uh, type something in the chat and we can get to you. But I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I know our meeting has gone a lot longer than originally anticipated, but uh, I thought it was an important conversation and uh, getting the information out there. So uh, I just can't stress, uh, I'm sorry, I just can't stress enough to any, anybody that has specific questions about their children because every case is different. Yep. Go to the building level administration. We have a very strong principal team, highly skilled AP team. If they don't have the answer, they know who to go to. It's either Janet, Stacy, Kathleen, or Dave, the assistant superintendent team, um, because we want we understand what the students have been through. Uh, I have three children myself that are going through the pandemic right now um, as students, and I just want to make sure that their their feedback is welcome. It's needed, especially as we work through stage two, and then there will be a stage three. So these are, these conversations are very important. Okay, uh, I got a question here. Uh, children with 504 and I, IEP that are all virtual, how will their needs be addressed? Apologize if I missed it, but didn't hear earlier. Uh, so getting back to uh, 504s and IEP, since they're so individualized, what I would reiterate is to reach out to the teacher that you're working with on the virtual level or speak to the building principal that your student is assigned to, or you can also email Dr. Stacy Scalisi. Uh, it's S Scalisi, S S S, uh, I'm sorry, S S C A L I S E at WFSD.K12.NY.US uh, because, you know, 504s and IEPs are very individualized. Uh, so, anything that you know it's a tough question to answer uh but again go back to the building administration uh and miss uh, dr scalisi has typed her email address in the chat box for everybody uh those are best handled by the special ed department as far as what uh needs to be addressed and how they'll go about doing it okay hope that answered that question anybody else and uh, thank you for the resource thank you dr scalisi okay all right I think we covered a lot of ground. Again, if you have any other questions, talk to your teachers first, your building administrators second. If you're not getting anywhere with them, reach out to the district administrative team, either Assistant Superintendent Kathleen Keene, Assistant Superintendent Stacy Scalisi, and of course, uh, the superintendent's office is also available. Uh, we're, all, we're all in this for the same reason, getting the best things done for our kids and getting through this healthy and safe. Uh, this is not something that anybody takes in a, in a cavalier attitude. Uh, we're all experiencing the same thing. Uh, I know many of us have experienced this uh, uh, COVID-19 disease quite personally and, and right at home, uh, myself included. So we know how serious this is. And uh, I want to thank our community. You guys have been great partners with us uh, since the shutdown and right on through to today. And also helping keep the keeping the numbers low community wide. I mean, it's an important thing, and we've seen much smaller communities, much smaller, smaller school communities have higher numbers than us. Uh, and and it's a it's a testament to the work that everybody around our community has been doing. So we really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to close out this portion of the Q and A, uh, and we're going to get to our business agenda now to hire all these virtual teachers and a few other items. Uh, so with that being said, I need a motion on our consent agenda. Uh, Trustee Gross, can I have a motion, please? Be resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the consent agenda consisting of the following agenda items be approved as a whole with action recorded as been taken severally. Personnel items 5.1 through 5.10. Can I have a second, uh, Vice President Coppola? Second. Second. Uh, we're going to do a roll call vote uh, for all in favor. Uh, Vice President Coppola? Yay. Trustee Gross? Aye. Trustee Tajani? Aye. Trustee Guerriero? Aye. Trustee Mentz? Aye. And it's an aye for me, 6-0, motion carries. Uh, that takes care of our business agenda this evening. Under board discussion, just two very, very quick things. And I, I know we're anxious to uh, put a bow on this tonight. Two quick things. Number one, I want to congratulate our local elected officials who were uh, 
Two of them were reelected, uh, Congressman Zeldin and Assemblyman DeStefano, sorry, three, and Assemblyman Thiel. I also want to congratulate our two new senators that represent our area, uh, Senator-elect uh, Alexis Weeks, I think that's how her, she pronounces her last name, and Senator-elect Anthony Palumbo. Uh, I want the community to be aware that we have already reached out to them uh, and have had... Uh, conversations about uh, setting up an appointment to come and get to know Floyd uh, and what our needs will be because they will be critically, critically important. All of those folks that I just mentioned will be critically important uh, regarding our budget going forward. Uh, so I want to congratulate them and we look forward to working with them and just know that this board has already made inroads to build and continue our collaborative working relationship with our elected officials and we anticipate that going forward and as well as working with our newly elected who will take office in January and they're, they'll be critically important at the state Senate level. So uh, good news on that front. Uh, the other thing under board discussion, uh, several board members uh, attended the New York State School Board Association's virtual annual convention, the 101st convention, the first one virtual. Uh, and there's been a lot of informative uh, workshops that were online. And uh, the good news with the virtual convention is that we get to take advantage of attending all the educational sessions that they have. Normally when you attend in person, you kind of have to pick and choose because they have multiple tracks going at the same time. So uh, we're, we're really getting our money's worth and our education worth. And uh, we're watching a lot of Zoom meetings and recorded sessions. Uh, and we're gonna have a full report out by the board members that attended. Uh, the New York State School Board Association convention. And it's very important as board members and leaders of a school community that uh, we network with the state association and the local association so that we don't govern in a, uh, isolation or in a vacuum. We get to hear best practices and ideas from all over the state and all over Long Island. So I wanna thank the board members who attended that. Um, and again, they'll report out at our meeting on December 8th uh, as far as the sessions they attended and what they got out of it. Um, any other items on the board discussion by the board members? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Trustee Mentz, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And seconded by Trustee Guerriero. Second. All in favor? Aye. Raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay, folks, uh, that concludes our meeting this evening. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, were there any other uh, comments or questions uh, on anything that we didn't cover by the public? I'm sorry. I think we covered it. So our meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, Five-day graduation. That's what Trustee Cabal is saying. Get ready for a five-day graduation. Oh, my goodness. My dry cleaner is going to be very happy with that. Anyway, um, okay, our meeting's adjourned. Our next meeting will be on December 8th. Everybody continue to stay safe, healthy, and well. And thank you for working with us. And thank you for the feedback and the questions. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Nice night.